All right, we are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us on the Plus on the News Channel 5 network and streaming live on Facebook at News Channel 5. As I said, now the second half of our program dedicated to taking a look at the latest right now on the, the studies and advancements in COVID-19 and joining us live from over at Vanderbilt, or I'm not sure where he is this morning, Dr. William Schaffner. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, always. Oh boy, I go back years with you, Dr. Schaffner. I've interviewed you for years, and uh, boy, you sure have grown into your role. You are an amazing spokesperson for that. And you know, we have some terrific infectious disease doctors that have been involved here from local universities, and you are uh, chief among them. You've been doing an awful lot of media, not just local, national, on sports talk radio even. Even, right. Well, it's terribly important to get the good word out, right? There's so much confusion out there about COVID. You try to get good information out to the viewers and to the listeners so they can adjust their own behaviors and know what's going on. Well, let's uh, let's address the, the most recent uh, development, at least in terms of what the president announced yesterday with regard to convalescent plasma. We've heard about maybe using antibodies from those who have recovered. Your take on, on, on what this means now with the FDA fast tracking it and and whether or not um, you think it's really going to help. Well, there are two sides to that coin from my point of view. This will clearly make convalescent plasma more available to more people across the country. The other side of that coin is, however, we don't really know yet as much as we would like about how well it works and in which patient populations. For example, here at Vanderbilt, my colleagues are heading up a nationwide study to try to determine how well convalescent plasma works. I actually think the FDA's action will make it a little harder for them to recruit patients into their study, but it's very important. You know, the uh, FDA commissioner said that the uh, convalescent plasma is, quote, possibly effective, and the data are suggestive, and that's certainly true. So we're optimistic about that, but we don't have the hard data yet. But has, has convalescent plasma already, or antibodies, hasn't it already been used in some patients now with some positive results in some cases, maybe not so much in others? Is it actually being used right now? It's being used actually much more widely than you would anticipate. Somewhere between 70 and 100,000 patients have actually received convalescent plasma across the country. And yet, we still don't know exactly what role it has in treatment. As I say, we're optimistic, we're hopeful, but I wish we had the hard data. That would make us much more comfortable when we're talking with patients. Okay, so I'm just curious, if someone is very ill, let's say, for instance, God forbid, you got COVID-19 and you were hospitalized, what are they gonna give you? Well, they will surely give me what's called remdesivir, that's one of the drugs. Low-dose dexamethasone is another drug that they will give, give me, that's that steroid. We know both of them are beneficial to, patient, to patients who are in intensive care units. We would have a discussion about convalescent plasma or my, <laughs> if I'm very sick, I'm sure I won't have that discussion, yeah. but my family members would with the doctors. All right, so as far as a vaccine is concerned, and I know they've got trials going on yeah. at Vanderbilt, can you give us an update on where that kind of stands at the moment? Well, that's actually very exciting, and we're optimistic about that also, because there are now three major manufacturers that are entering vaccine trials, the large trials which will determine how well the vaccine works and how safe it is in the United States and in other locations around the world. So we're clearly making progress. There are other countries, China and Russia among them, who are also working on vaccines. So there's an awful lot of scientific talent working on that around the world. While we wait for that, what do you think when we look around the world in places like Italy or even Wuhan, China, where you know they were just extreme hot spots and now things have improved to a degree. Can you talk a little bit about, say, Italy or, or some of these cities in China where it all started, about how things have improved and what we can maybe learn from that here in the States? 
Well, things have improved enormously in China. They're counting each and every case, and they have very small numbers. Similarly, in Italy and many other European countries, in uh, New Zealand, for example, the same thing. There are lots of things that we could learn because, uh, as you probably know, I'm concerned that our response here in the United States has not been very good. I give it a D plus at the best. Mm -hmm. It's very heterogeneous across the country. We ought to have a national policy. We ought to get, we ought to depoliticize our response to the virus. The virus doesn't care how you vote. The virus just wants to infect you. But we have really politicized our response. I think everybody in this country the moment they walk out their front doors should be wearing a mask. We should be doing social distancing and we should not still be gathering in large groups. I know that makes lots of people unhappy, but if you want to control the virus, those are the things we can do now until and if a vaccine becomes available. Remember, the vaccine's not a sure thing. And in the meantime, a thousand people a day at least are dying of this illness. So we obviously know what works. All right, Dr. Schaffner, I know you're a humble guy. Give me a little bit about your educational background and how you got to where you are now. I just want to know, give me, give me you know, what, what your training is. Uh, well, my training is in internal medicine and as an infectious disease and public health specialist. I've had a foot in both camps. And very early on, I loved treating people and making them better. And then I became entranced uh, because I had the uh, opportunity to fulfill my draft obligation as a commissioned officer in the public health service at the CDC. While there, I became entranced with actually preventing illness. So I didn't have to treat you when you got sick. You know, Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, I've been interested in everything we can do to prevent illness on the front end. And of course, that got me very interested in vaccines. Sure, and you've, you've been educated, you have degrees from? Uh, I, I, I was a scholarship kid who was able to go to Yale, and then I went to Cornell's medical school, and after that I came to Vanderbilt to do my internship, residency, and fellowship training, and uh, as I like to say, they haven't gotten rid of me yet. <laughs> okay, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but okay, Yale. Cornell, Vanderbilt, all right? Obviously someone, you know, universally respected for your knowledge. I, I'm just wondering, and, and you just said it a moment ago, it may upset some people, but you definitively saying, and you don't have any dog in this fight other than public health, that social distancing and a mask works. And I can't tell you how often I hear on Facebook or comments, no, they don't work, this is a hoax, so social distancing, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. How do you feel when you have these people that maybe just have lay jobs like me every day question your expertise with your background. Does it drive you crazy? Well, it's bothersome because I think that's part of the politicization of uh, our response to the virus. I would have preferred it if our political leadership had let actually the public health people and the people at the NIH go to the fore and the politicians stand behind them, supporting them. So Dr. Fauci at the NIH could have talked about all the research. Dr. Redfield at the CDC could have talked about the uh, public health interventions and the politicians, I think, should have said, we stand behind you 100% and we ask that everybody help and join together in this effort. The COVID virus is A, not a hoax. B, it's not going to disappear. Three, it's very contagious. Four, it is with us now and will be with us into the winter when flu will also strike, giving us a double hit, a twindemic, as a friend of mine has called it. And that will put even more strain 
on our health care system. So this is serious business. It's not a hoax. And by the way, you do mention the flu, and I was going to bring that up. That's coming again. One, whether or not you have any insight into what we've learned about the flu from the South American countries where maybe it starts first, how severe that flu season looks to be this year. And would it be possible for an individual to get both COVID-19 and the flu at the same time this fall? Well, first of all, uh, what happens in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, their winter during our summer, sometimes is predictive of what will happen here, but not always. They've had a moderate influenza season, but mind you, they've done everything to prevent COVID. And you know what that sure. does? It also helps prevent sure. flu, sure. it's spread. So that's helped. So we just know that flu will be here because it's here every year. And it will be confusing to doctors and patients because the two look an awful lot alike. And to answer your question, there are already reports of people who've had both infections simultaneously. Ah. It's not clear whether that makes you doubly sick, but it's certainly something that we can avoid. And let me get in a plug already. Sure. We should all of us get influenza vaccine once it starts to become widely available in mid-September and into October. It's not a perfect vaccine. We all know that. But waiting for perfection, said Voltaire, is the great <laughs> enemy of the current good. We got a pretty good vaccine that can do a lot of good. You know, even if you get the vaccine and then get sick with flu, your illness is going to be milder, less severe. You're less likely to have to be hospitalized and you're less likely to die. Sure. What's wrong with that? No. Let's all get vaccinated this fall. Do you have any other insight with regard to how severe the symptoms may be? And you just made a good example there of getting it maybe if you had a vaccine because you had some protection as to why some people have such a severe reaction and other people don't. Is, is, it, is it genetic? Is it because you only get exposed to maybe a certain strain of COVID-19 and there's different strengths of them? Any idea? Because to me, it seems like it's almost Russian roulette. You have some people saying, well, I'll just recover from it. No problem. And I'm thinking, one, you don't know what you're getting for sure. And if you'll have a bad reaction. And two, you know what really bothers me the most, Doc, is after I maybe recover, if I get it, I know down the road, there can be side effects that stay with me for years. Every ache and pain I'll have five years from now, I'm going to think is COVID related. Well, let's talk about COVID and how it does make people sick. Of course, we're learning about this virus every day. We're writing the textbook as we speak. But one of the things we know is the older you are, if you get infected, the more likely you are to be severely ill. That's clear. Older people, people age 65 and older, are much more likely to be ill, seriously ill, than young children, that's dramatic. Second thing is, if you have any underlying illness, high blood pressure, diabetes, if you're stout, if you're obese, if you have any kind of heart disease or lung disease or immunocompromised, all of those things make it more likely that you will have a severe illness. And you're exactly right. One of the things we're learning is that even after you recover from the severe illness, you may have lingering symptoms for quite some time. For how long, we're not quite sure yet because we're just starting to follow people over time. But yes, you can feel fatigued, have headache. Some people even have some confused thinking for a while. Your sense of taste and smell may take a while to get better. So we're learning that this is, and, and well, let me put it this way, the more we learn about this virus, the nastier it becomes. Yeah. It's not a hoax and it's not going to go away. Prevention is important and we're all in this together. What you do will help prevent my infection. What I do helps prevent your infection. Let's all work together. Americans have done that for ages, we can do it with COVID. Other countries have done it. Doctor, let's take a phone call for you. We've got John on line one. John, good morning. What's your question, John? Um, is it, uh, what about the safety of going to the dentist at this time? 
Going to the dentist, all right? Go ahead. You know, some medical procedures, dental procedures. What about that, doctor? Well, I think it's a very, very important issue because obviously you and the dentist or the dental hygienist, you're going to get very close. And of course, you transmit this infection when you're close to someone via the respiratory route. If you breathe out, they can breathe in. My wife has gone to the dentist. I'm due. I encourage that because the dental hygienist and the dentist are going to use good masking and often also a face shield when they work on you. And I think you can go to the dentist safely now. All right, safely to go to the dentist now. Um, there was a report this morning where I see there's a huge backlog adding up because many people are staying away from doctors, not getting their annual physicals, not getting basic things because of COVID and they fear going to where a medical facility is and that it's going to create a huge backlog down the road. You think it would be safe to go get your physical and the like right now? I know actually, as a matter of fact, I did just about a month ago. Um, you know, we social distanced and were cautious, but we did that. What's your recommendation on that front? I think you and your provider need to have a discussion about each individual medical event. There are still a lot of good things that can be done with telemedicine. But I've just, for example, been advocating influenza vaccination. Can't do that with telemedicine. It's right. very hard. Right. You have to be there and roll up your sleeve. The trick is to be in and out very quickly and for the healthcare provider, whether it's the nurse, the doctor, whomever, to actually use a mask, use face shields, gloves and gowns when they give you the shot. So in and out very quickly. You can do that, for example, at a pharmacist. One of the things I would like to emphasize is we have seen a big diminution, a big drop in vaccinations of children, routine vaccinations of children. And the last thing we want is for measles and diphtheria and all those terrible childhood diseases to come back. Moms, you can take your children in safely to the family doctor and to the pediatrician. Get them vaccinated. It's very important. You can do that safely now. One last point as we wrap things up, I want to give you a chance to give us a little information on the podcast you're working on. We've just got about a minute or so. Well, it's a podcast that we're doing to educate people as much as possible about uh, influenza and COVID and how important it is to get vaccinated. I think that's fantastic. Well, Dr. Schaffner, thank you. You're a voice of reason, and I hope people listen to you and understand that uh, you're speaking to us from a public health standpoint. You have the background and the experience. You're not here telling us lies. You tell us the truth, and people need to listen. And that what I take from you is that we know what works. We just have to do it. I love it. You're singing my song. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You take care of yourself, sir, and thank you. I know how busy you are. I really appreciate it. It's good seeing you. You take care of yourself. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay safe. All right. Dr. William Schaffner over at Vanderbilt laying it out there for us. Um, you want to question his credentials? You think you know more than him? You don't. We're going to take a break. I'll wrap things up right after this.